Fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. This upcoming concert season will be all about the boots, and Tecovis is your stop for the best in Western style. Tecovis has seasonal and limited edition offerings this spring and summer, including men's and women's boots, apparel, hats, bags, and more. All Tecovis boots are made by hand in a time-honored tradition with timeless styles that are always on trend. And Tecovis has first wear comfort with little to no break-in period. It's hard to find this level of comfort paired with this level of style. Stop by your local Tecova store, have a complimentary drink or two, that's WCB style, and shop new styles. The smell of fresh leather and friendly staff are at your service. Many stores even have leather custom branding to make your boots truly personalized. And with regular live music and events, there's no in-store experience like it. If you can't make it into a store, just visit tecovas.com. That's T-E-C-O-V-A-S.com. They offer free shipping on all boots as well as free returns and exchanges and ship right to your door. Go to tecovas.com and find your new favorite pair of boots today. It's done. The goal of the year, part of the past, the celebrations, forgotten, the history, history, we're back to a blank slate, clean ice, all that matters now is what happens next, the Stanley Cup playoffs, Eastern Conference Final begins Wednesday. Welcome back to the Survival and Basic Badass Podcast, Kevin and Chuck. Today, we're going to talk about distillation and making your own alcohol. Um, You're thinking, well, you know, as a prepper, why would that be important to me? Why would I care? Um, Well, it turns out that I like alcohol. So, there you go. That's one thing. You might use it as fuel. Now, the best reason that I've come up with is alcohol is perfect to strengthen kinship and build community bonds. And who can argue with that? That's right. That's important. That's solid, right? Mm -hmm. I I think the perfect recipe for a long-lasting friendship is an argument, a fist fight, and then having shots together. That only sounds right. Mm-hmm. So one of our uh, listeners, actually Shane most recently, but I think a few of you guys have actually requested that we get hot on the trail of uh, the homebrew. And me and Kevin have kind of put this episode off again, not something we had a lot of experience in. Mm-hmm. And due to current laws, we will tell you that we still don't have any experience in. Correct. But this is something that we've been, you know, looking into and and curious about the process. And we're going to share some of that great knowledge that we uh, uncovered. That's right. That's right. Now, alcohol over 60 percent can be used to sterilize things. And alcohol over 40 percent can be used to disinfect things. And it's also good for setting crap on fire. That's right. Molotov cocktails weren't always made out of gasoline. No. That's right. So, um, now, before we get too much into uh, uses for... Well, you want to talk about that first? Other well, uses for alcohol? Other uses, yeah. As a prepper, why, mm-hmm. yeah. And Anything yeah. you got on that? Now, alcohol can be used for just about anything. It, you know, depending on the, the purity of the alcohol you're used. I always advocate... Uh, Keep, you know, buying and keeping rubbing alcohol. Okay. Uh, it lasts forever. You know, if you buy a bottle of whiskey and you open it up, take a couple of swigs off it, put the top back on and set it down, it'll be good forever. 
You don't have to worry about opening it and then closing it. It's not like wine. You know, it's not like beer to last. You know, beer's not going to last very long. Beer's not going to last very long. Especially if the refrigerator's not, not running. Um, alcohol, though, can come in useful in a lot of things. Well, we can Just talk washing about your hands, salaries. washing, washing the, uh, you know, cleaning the kitchen. Um, and it's also something that's great for trading. Um, especially if you can make your own. Uh, there's not a whole lot of people out there that are going to be um, equipped equipped to make it. Yes. Uh, I know a lot of you guys. Now, what I'm going to say here is if you're learning about making moonshine, don't learn it from somebody that sounds like me. If no. you go down south and you can barely understand what that guy's saying, he's the one you want to learn it from. Those are the guys that know. Franklin County? That's right, buddy. That's right. All right. Uncle Jesse knows the way. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit well, about America's history All right, with alcohol. Let's talk mm-hmm. about that, because here's the thing. It turns out that the first, like, distilled alcohol, now, we're, mm-hmm. now there's mead and there's beer, but we're talking about spirits, mm-hmm. if you will, like alcohol. So as far as we know, the first distill and, and distillation process came around in about the 12th century in Italy. And you know that taxes came soon behind Mm -hmm. because needful things and the government loves to tax. Got to get a piece of that. Now, you may remember somewhere back in America's history, we had a thing about throwing tea in the harbor. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because... What was the reason for that? They wanted to tax like... 3% 3% or some shit on bags of tea. Bullshit! And we said, fuck the British. <laughs> uh-huh. That isn't going to fly. We're going to have we're a whole revolution that. over that. So then we're like, you know, we're going to have a country where the government can freaking stick it. And now some of you might be saying, well, you know, it was taxation without representation. Right. It wasn't just taxation. But some of us had a few beers hit the bar and we're like, taxes? What the? <laughs> Get yeah. out of here. So it played out something like this. Around 1791. Mm-hmm. Turns out we were just recovering from this Revolutionary War thing. Yeah. George Washington had this big army. And he's like, you know, these guys wanted to get paid. Now, he wasn't still running the army in 1791. But no, he's say, commander in chief. He, he was, was looking president. out. He was looking out for his boys. Right. He's like, you know, they want to get paid. What we should do is we should tax whiskey. Mm -hmm. All all everyone drinks whiskey. Yeah, all spirits, but we primarily were making whiskey. Right. Exactly. There weren't a whole lot of vodka. This is America. That's right. We're not commie pankos who, Mm -hmm. you know. All right. So they were like, let's tax the shit out of that. That'd be great. We pay for the war because everyone's drinking whiskey and they're not going to stop. Mm-hmm. You know, they they put that freaking nickel tax on freaking water in New York. They charged me a nickel for my plastic bottle. And I said, fuck, I'm going to stop drinking water. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to stop drinking whiskey. That's right. I mean, come on. You got to have priorities, right? I gave up water for lead. Water. You're like, no, I can't do it anymore. You're going to tax it. So that's out. So anyway, Americans being Americans... Turns out we had a little thing. That's right. We threw a revolution. A revolution. Got to have one every couple of years. We haven't had one in a while. I'm looking forward to the like, next one. But it's been 1776. Now it's 1791. Actually, I think they long. got around to it around 1793. Mm-hmm. But they were like, fuck it. Let's have the Whiskey Rebellion. And basically they rose up and got pissed off and pretty much that's about it. It really didn't amount to much. Yeah, they sent out a big uh, a big militia and they arrested 20 guys and then all the guys got pardoned. And, and yeah, uh, you know, really they were like, thing. yeah, we like whiskey too. Yeah. It's all good. Went on know. for a while with the with the taxing. You know, the problem with, with the taxing, a lot of the farmers had a lot of extra rye. And what they right. would do with the extra rye was and they fruit. would make whiskey. And if you can't get rid of your stuff, your mm-hmm. extra corn, your extra fruit, your extra whiskey, right. your extra rye, sorry, right. you're going to make alcohol because mm-hmm. that's another way to turn it into profit. Right. Now, so time goes on in America. We're like, all right, we're good. We can all get along. 
Let's have beer. It'll yeah. all work out. Let's all drink some whiskey together. Then we had this angry civil war. Mm-hmm. Now, civil war, prior to the civil war, whiskey or all spirits, so liquor, not beer, were taxed at 20 cents on the gallon. Okay. 20 cents. Work with me for a gallon, right? Mm-hmm. Fight the Civil War. They're like, fuck, now we got to pay for this thing. Another war. We got to pay for it. What can we tax? And they were like, let's tax all the alcohol again. Mm-hmm. So it These goes. Sons of bitches. It's freaking Abraham Lincoln. Mm-hmm. It goes from 20 cents a gallon to $2 a gallon. What the hell? <laughs> Again, everyone's like, fuck. Abe, you son of a gun. <laughs> this guy gets all the credit. Uh-huh. They're like, oh, he's great. I didn't know anything about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they never talk about this nope. when they're praising Abraham nope. Lincoln. It never comes up. $2 tax. So that got people thinking, you know, we really need to be making our own. And it kind of pushed more and more. And when the government keeps creeping in. I was learning a lot about uh, about um, prohibition and all that, and I gotta say, they said they comp- confiscated it was something like six hundred ninety three thousand stills mm-hmm. during prohibition. Yeah. I mean, it is insane. Mm-hmm. And but the thing is, everybody was drunk. They said it was worse <laughs> during <laughs> prohibition. Well, than here's it was. the big guy t- uh, takeout from prohibition. What it used what used to happen. Was that men would get off of work, they'd go get drunk with their paycheck, go home and smack up their wife. Standard, standard fare. But during Prohibition, men would take their women out on dates to stay. Yeah, stills. see that's so. Nice. This is so. What it really did was brought the family brought together. It. We were just talking. Now men and women could Kin get drunk and families coming together. That's right. It's beautiful. Well, speaking of women coming together Mm -hmm. with alcohol, they had something called the Reigns Laws in New York City. And this is pretty slick. Here, you're going to like this one. So this is actually prior to Prohibition. Mm -hmm. They were testing things out. They said, you know what? We're going to outlaw alcohol sales on Sundays. However, we're going to allow it in hotels. Because hotels, you know, they're doing business. You don't want to, you know, hurt Mm -hmm. tourism, whatever. So all the bars were like, you know what we should do? We have a room upstairs. We should make it a hotel here and rent out the room. Mm -hmm. And then we can have alcohol. We're good to go. Good thinking. Genius, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the American ingenuitive spirit, whatever. So they go. They run out the room, and then they're like, well, we're not really a hotel. What are we going to use that room for? They were like, you know what? Prostitution would be perfect. Perfect. (laughs) And it turns out they may have actually created a little problem Mm. where kind of prostitution was running rampant in all the bars. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's one of the ways that it really came out. You know, and really spread in the Northeast there. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure prostitution's, you know, the oldest profession. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it started because of this. Yeah. I'm just saying the prostitution in the bar Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, you know. That's right. So, I'm sure that you guys are like, yeah, but Chuck, you're talking a lot. I hear your, your lips moving, but I still don't know how to make alcohol. Right. Kevin, you're going to help us out on that? That's right. That's right. Now, before we get started, I want to talk a about little bit laws? about the legality of it. All right. There are some All right. some problems. with Now, you can make beer right. in America. No permit needed. No permit. Well, no federal permit needed. No, and for personal consumption, and don't be trying to give it to your friends. Yeah, don't share it. Don't you share just it. invite them over. Don't put it in your car and then drink and it in front it of them and tell them what it tastes like. That sounds right. Right. All right. So it is legal to own your own still, no matter the size. Okay. Uh, but what you're supposed to do with that still is use it, one, as decoration. They are nice decoration. Right. Two, you can use it to distill water. Three, you can, dis- you, you can distill essential oils with your still. I don't know what essential oils are. I don't feel like they're very essential because I've never needed any. All right. But 
um, what you can't do is distill alcohol in your still. Mm. Unless. Oh. Unless you get a uh, distilled spirits permit or a federal fuel alcohol permit. All right, tell me about those. Now, the sti- distilled spirits permit is uh, basically to produce and distribute alcohol. That would be like Jim Beam, um, you know, Jack Daniels. Now, they have to get these In permits. my research, they said Jim Beam is the Pepsi of whiskey. Oh, is it really? And they said that if you're serious about whiskey, you're drinking wild turkey. I never really liked Jim Beam or wild turkey. I definitely never liked wild turkey. And I'll be honest, this might sound a little unpatriotic. I'm not a big fan of bourbons. I'm more of a fan of of Irish whiskey. It gets down to it. If I had my choice. This is uh, pretty special. All right. All right. Well, I'll give that a try. Um, But you're looking at like 50 grand and jumping through a lot of hoops to get a distilled spirits permit. Uh, But the federal fuel and alcohol, fuel alcohol permit. You can get that for free, and they don't deny anybody that. Now, you can make alcohol and power your lawnmower with this permit, and everything's kosher. Nobody's going to give you a hard time. Now, if some spills out of your lawnmower into your mouth, I don't think there's really that's really a big deal. So It sounds like a big deal. It, it, now, you realize when you say not a big deal— you realize there's an agency called Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms. Which, I, to me, it seems like that's, they have to have the greatest parties. Now, I, mean, if, <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a fantastic Friday. But now you're thinking the ATF just goes around measuring barrel lengths. Mm-hmm. That's my understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, they seemed really worried about the bump stocks for a little while there. Mm-hmm. They still haven't caught on that binary triggers are way cooler than bump stocks. But I think they're going around opening up garage doors at random, just like, oh, <laughs> I thought I smelled something fermenting in there. Uh huh. And then they realize and there were then just they some rotten apples in it. They, you've got a federal fuel alcohol permit, and so it's completely legal. Completely legal. All right, so we got the laws covered. Mm-hmm. Basically, they actually, you know, Kevin's like, yeah, whatever, what are they going to do? But they do take it pretty seriously. Um, it is a serious crime. So all this information that we're going to provide to you is for entertainment or for the apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Or if you're just really thirsty and need some alcohol and you don't care about the laws, right? Then this would be appropriate for you. Mm-hmm. So right. I'm not going to say fuck the government, but you the, know what I'm saying. There's a wink and a nod uh-huh. involved. Is that All what right. you're? So I'm going to give you get your notebooks, your pens out right now. I'm going to give you step by step. Now, really, I I can sum it up in three words: uh-huh. ferment, distill, and age. Mm-hmm. Handled it. You know how to make alcohol. Mm-hmm. Now Kevin's going to go a little bit deeper. Now this he is a, I'm going to give you. Words. I'm going to give you very specific uh, stuff here. This is not going to make the best moonshine. If you make moonshine and you listen to this recipe, don't follow it because I'm only, only going to make your job worse. Only going to make your product worse. Now I but, actually can give you a book recommendation. All right. Um, and this guy might actually help you out with. Uh, fermenting and making alcohol with recipes the home distillers workbook by jeff king has great recipes for moonshine if that's something you were interested in Mm -hmm. but we're going to cover the basics and get you get you going so kevin all right now what you're going to need is about 15 feet of copper tubing a pressure cooker and two clean pots. Um, you're going to need a drill bit, a metal drill bit, the same width as the copper tubing. All right? So, first, bring 10 gallons of water to a boil in one of your clean pots. Now, you're thinking fresh mountain water, whatever. This is part of why the boiling is happening right now. Mm-hmm. Is you actually, you know, the bacteria we talked about, in previous yeah, episodes. Important. I would start with distilled water. You can use tap water, but I'd start with distilled water. Um, 
boil 10 gallons, add 10 pounds of cornmeal. Cook it until it becomes a paste. You're going to boil it down, make sure the cornmeal all mixes in, and uh, allow it to cool. Pour it into a, a clean bucket and stir in 10 pounds of sugar. Add half ounce of uh, half ounce of yeast and mix it thoroughly. Now you're gonna ferment the mash. That this is this is mash now. Uh, loosely cover it with a cheesecloth and cool in a uh, store it in a cool dark place. Um, a brown foam will appear on the top of the mash bucket and begin rising. The mash is ready when it stops rising. So it'll take, you know, four to ten days, somewhere yeah, in there. It really depends how much sugar and how, how active the right. yeast is that you have. Um, with that, make sure before you add the yeast that it cools down. Right, right. You have to bring it down You're gonna to You're going to kill about, the yeast if you, don't, right. if you don't do that. All right. Strain the mash through a cheesecloth into your... Second you, know, you can pot. use your wife's sheets, whatever you want to do. Yeah, you can use a screen. You just want to get a t-shirt. The you can thick use cheesecloth out yeah. of there. Exactly. You can use anything to strain it through. It doesn't have to be cheesecloth. It can be a screen that you yanked off your window as long as it's clean. All right. So you're going to screen it into into your your pot there, and then uh, you're going to take your pressure cooker. You're going to drill a quarter inch hole in it. If you have quarter inch copper tubing, whatever size copper tubing you got, you want it to be the exact same uh, exact same width. Now, gonna... I would have used half inch. Well, you go ahead. You okay. go right ahead. Just get a half inch drill bit. All right. Drill a hole in the top of your pressure cooker. All right. So we're ready to get ready to go here. Um. Let's see. Uh, you put so you put your mash into the pressure cooker. With a hole drilled in the top, copper t- copper tubing goes in the hole. Um, copper tubing then runs from your pressure cooker into your sink that's full of cool water or just a, just something with cold water and spiral it around so it has more contact time. Then from the sink down to your second pot. Now you're going to heat your pressure cooker up to 80 degrees Celsius. What are we, some sort of socialist here? 177 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, alcohol becomes ethanol steam as it heats up, travels through your condenser and into your bucket. But anything that comes out of that tube before your pressure cooker reaches uh, 177 degrees is methanol, which will make you go blind. So don't right. drink it. <laughs> so, and then you're gonna want to keep, keep, right. keep it running until you get about two ounces out all to right. clear that. I got all a out. couple of words for you. Well, so basically, as you bring the temperature up, now you want to bring it up slowly when mm-hmm. you're heating this up. Now, once you hit 173 degrees, actually is when alcohol starts to evaporate. Mm-hmm. 173 degrees. The first things that are going to evaporate, they call it the, work with me, the four shot. Mm -hmm. Now, usually they say it's the first quarter of a percent of all that you're going to get out of there is is the four shot. Mm -hmm. That's the the methanol Methanol. you're talking about. Now, it is poison. This is the part they're talking about that'll make you go blind. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not good. Usually, you can do the math and figure out. I would say they say the first half of a percent. Mm-hmm. I would say even go as far as a uh, the first percent. Mm-hmm. Um, this is going to smell horrible. Yeah, that, you're, that's you're how you're going to know it's the bad stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, next, you're going to get so first you get the four shot, then you get the head. And then you get the good stuff, then you get the tails. So the head, basically, you're going to kind of fill your first container with, you first toss the four shot, that little bit. Mm -hmm. You're going to know by the smell that this is wrong and and not anything you want. Mm -hmm. You're going to toss that. The next container is going to be kind of the heads, and you kind of set that aside. 
then once you see it coming clear and it smells clear, then that's going to be the good stuff. Then as you start to approach 198 degrees, that's when you start getting into the tails, which is where it starts to go bad again, starting to mix into the water and, and that kind of stuff. Um, again, you should be taking separate like containers each time. Mm -hmm. But sorry to interrupt. All right, go so, on. I know I, I broke the flow here. All right, so you've got a so you've you've got your alcohol dripping in here yes. in the pot over time as it heats. You're gonna try and maintain a, a somewhat constant temperature as best as you can. Uh, as it condenses, it's gonna drip into your new pot. Now, you want to get rid of the. The, the heads and the tails, right? You want to get rid of the, the beginning part and the last little bit. But if you followed all these directions properly, you should be the proud owner of two gallons of distilled moonshine. Excellent. Now, this moonshine is going to be super strong, like 90% alcohol. So you're going to want to cut that with like 50% distilled water. Okay. Just and so usually, that you don't now realize you don't kill yourself. You're still drinking this, so you want to use quality water. Mm -hmm. You don't, you know, you put all this effort in. Now, also that heads and tails, you actually can mix that into the mash of your next batch, mm -hmm. and that'll keep kind of a continuity of flavor and different things going on there. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, you, you really, you know, what we're telling you is not enough. To, you know, maybe make quality liquor. Mm -hmm. I would agree with what Kevin just told you. You probably could make liquor. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you want to get into it, you're going to have to do some research. Right. And the real difference between moonshine and whiskey is aging. And you that's know. that's a nice thing, too. Alcohol, you know, the flavor. Like, honestly, the higher the alcohol content the less flavor you're going to have in it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times they'll store it. Again, this is something where the extra books and the research and trial and error. But you know how they talk about aging it in uh, like charred barrels or, right. you know, uh, oak barrels. But sometimes, a lot of times they'll say charred. Mm -hmm. um, people will take like white oak and if you bake it in the oven, you can actually kind of char it on your own. You'll wrap it in foil, bake it for a while. Um, the hotter you bake it, will give it a, a sweeter, more vanilla-like flavor. Whereas if you kind of have it closer to wood, it's going to be a drier flavor. Mm -hmm. But you could throw that in and let it age a little bit. Right. Now, keep in mind, um, as soon as you take it out of the oak and put it in a bottle, glass bottle, the aging stops. Uh, if you have, if you have, you know, two year old whiskey in yeah, a, in a, a bottle, bottle on your shelf and throw the wood in it, you you're could okay. do that. It will right. still age. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, yeah. uh, you know, if you have two year old whiskey on your shelf for three years, it's not now five year, five no? year aged whiskey. No, no. it I, stops I, I aging. I don't like that anymore. So, cause I was saving. Yeah. No, it's not. Damn. It doesn't change once it's in the bottle. That's it. it that's it. Whether you open it, mm -hmm. drink from it. You can do whatever you want with it. It's it's not going to go bad. It's not going to age. It's not going to do anything. So that's why alcohol is a perfect thing for a prepper to store, just because it's set and forget. And it is the barter dream item. Yeah. I have a hard time with the forget part, though. <laughs> <laughs> you don't forget, huh? Uh, no, I, I'm... I'm all right. I'm always looking into that bottle. That's all right. It's all right. Now... For those of us that still have refrigeration and electricity, I would say it's easier to go down to the liquor store. However, let me tell you a cool trick. There's something called freeze distillation. All right. Now, freeze distillation, if you took mash, mm -hmm. like you were just talking about, you let it ferment, right? You put it in a container, put it in your freezer, Turns out alcohol doesn't freeze at the same temperature that water and the rest of it does. Mm -hmm. If you then drop it into a strainer once it's frozen, all the alcohol will drip out. Nice. nice. You didn't have to do any of this. Mm -hmm. And I don't even see the freaking ATF kicking down your door for that. I'm just saying this can be tried with just take a beer. 
throw it in the fridge in the freezer try it out see what happens i i did have a problem with, with that when i was in the navy with frozen beers in my mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in my little uh, dorm room were you freezer. sucking uh yeah i didn't do a good job i put it in there thinking these bottles will be fine and uh they were not fine now some advice Need some expansion room <laughs> all right some advice i have for you guys who might want to try stuff like this ventilation is your friend turns out alcohol vapor and alcohol are both flammable um you need to be aware of this you need to take precautions Mm -hmm. things to catch on fire things to explode usually people are heating stills with fire Mm -hmm. sometimes you have it on a burner plate guess what burner plates can start fires that's right you just ventilation Mm -hmm. that's all i'm saying I'm not saying you have to be crazy. Yeah. Go back to the show reason. where we are talking about uh, getting a fire extinguisher. Yeah. There's a reason these guys go out in the woods. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just saying, you know, think about that. Um, not it, as dangerous as, as cooking meth. No. But dangerous nonetheless. All right. Now, we, should we do a show on how to cook meth? No, I'd rather not. No, you don't think that's a good idea? No. No. I mean, the ATF isn't going to go ma- come after us for that. No. No, I think we're good. That's out of their wheelhouse. We're safe from those guys. <sighs> All right. Now, there's also mead. Mm-hmm. Let's talk now, about mead. I don't have a lot to, to add on mead. I have made my own beer. Let me tell you about beer first, and then we'll get into mead. All right. Um, so I made my own beer, and the deal is just like with making mash you need to clean everything good Mm -hmm. um you want to use like a light bleach you know um so what i mean by a light bleach maybe for a gallon of water you're putting like a cap full of bleach Mm -hmm. and you want to clean everything and that's going to kill any of the yeast um you need all the bottles that you're going to store it in you got to clean it you got to clean it with the bleach. All the thermometers, the probes, the different things, they all need to be cleaned so that you don't get yeast. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll pick up yeast from the air and from everything around you, and you will have bad, weird, horrible flavors Mm -hmm. that will find their way into your alcohol and into your beer, into your spirits, whatever you're making. Mm -hmm. So be aware of that, and it makes for a bit of work. Mm -hmm. Um, That's why I'm not beer maker all the time it's like special occasion because it's like all right how much work do i want to go through to get you know 48 bottles of beer you know Mm -hmm. you're like yeah i could just go spend like 30 bucks or something right And, and that's you know that's that's a big part of this sort of stuff Unless you're making a lot or just trying to learn how to do it right. so you can do it in the future. It is a it's skill. Not, yeah, it's not really worthwhile. It is something that you can learn a lot from yes. uh, by doing it yourself. Now, I have a friend named uh, Nate who makes his own beer, and I hear it's really good, but I've never tasted it. And I know Nate's listening, so let's make this happen. <laughs> I've made beer. You've had mm-hmm. my beer. Yeah, and it it's fantastic. Good. It, it was, was good. That's thing. It's like, I, I think I maybe I made five batches of beer, and I would say two were amazing. Two were as good or slightly better than like Sam Adams, mm-hmm. and then one was like maybe better than Miller Lite, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was like, and I think it was like my fourth that it was maybe better than Miller Lite. Well, you tried to get fancy with that one. I remember that one. And I'm like, yeah, I just don't even know if I'm going to make beer anymore. Yeah. Because it just, uh... So, anyway. So, it's something to dabble into. Um, Quality yeast, keeping your stuff clean, um, adding the appropriate amount of sugar to carbonate it. Right. Um, Different stuff like that, all things to learn. And it is. It's a trial and error thing. And it's kind of cool, but... Don't th- it's a hobby and a commitment, mm-hmm. and you know, yeah. Don't do it like oh, I'll be able to get cheaper beer. Th- that's not a better that, way yeah, to go. That's not the way to go. Um, it's like oh, I really want quality beer that I can be proud of and share with my friends. Then it's a good idea and it's worth it. Mm-hmm. So, quick thing, yes. 
Uh, well, let's let's talk real quick about uh, juice, juice hooch. Okay. Uh, making wine out of juicy juice or or whatever. Now, I don't have any uh, information to back this up, but I know I've read it at some point. Uh, during Prohibition, uh, some of the juice companies would sell the juice with a little disclaimer on the yes. bottom that said, basically, whatever you do, do not. Put this in a bottle for 21 <laughs> right. days. Add, add, add yeast at seven and cover degrees. it with cheesecloth and put it in your cabinet for two weeks because you might end up getting drunk when you drink it. Yes. Uh, it's um, really to easy sell, to make. Uh, raisin cakes mm -hmm. and the same thing. And they would send attractive girls to go and explain how dangerous it could be if you left it mm -hmm. unattended for, you know. And right. how it could become alcohol, and you need to be careful and make sure it doesn't ferment. And mm -hmm. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, so, yeah, so if you get a, a 64-ounce bottle of Juicy Juice or um, apple juice, it has to have uh, 20 grams of sugar per serving, basically, okay. is the rule of thumb with this. Which is, you know, you're not, you want to get something, something real sugary. Um, mix the yeast with the juice. Add an airlock to it, basically to let air escape, but not let air in. Um, you could also just use a balloon and let the balloon fill up and, and just let the balloon air out every, you know, every once in a while. Um, allow it to ferment for five days, cap it, put it in the refrigerator, ready to go. You got your own crappy wine. So I mean that's definitely uh definitely something to keep in mind if you're just looking to get drunk and and you're not 21 yet and you can't buy your own alcohol you can make it yourself, easy to do. Secret of the pros, yep. right there. All right now now meat is the drink of Vikings. Right, right. I don't why know why would you not want to be like mm -hmm. a Viking, right? Mm -hmm. So meat is basically like think half honey, half water. That's pretty much mead. Add yeast, you're good to go. Turns out honey on its own is uh, not going to ferment. But if you dilute it about 50%, you're good to go. Now, what they typically would do is they would take fruit. Um, a lot of the recipes I found online, they talk about uh, just buying like a small package of organic raisins mm -hmm. and putting it in with the honey and the uh, the water. And there's enough yeast in that that it would do it. You know, it would ferment on its own. Mm -hmm. And you can just let it do its thing. So organic raisins, honey. Um, they would say like two pounds of honey to a gallon of uh, water. Okay. Um, and like I said, throw in some raisins. But you can use anything. You could use um, anything. Anything with skins that are yeasty. Um, so these could be, you know, grapes and raisins are the same, you know, kind right. of idea. Um, you know, a lot of apples and different things like that. You're going to get these. Now, they actually, back in the day, a lot of times would just take the honey and the water and just leave it open to the air. Mm -hmm. And whatever yeast kind of came along, sometimes it, you can use like any kind of edible flour, stuff like that. They would put that in there, and the yeast from that would happen. And what they would do is they would actually keep some of the old and put it in the new if they got a good yeast. Mm -hmm. So, And they would kind of keep it going from one to the next. So they're getting the yeast from natural from the air, but then they would take it, you know, from... Now, you can also just go to the grocery store and buy, like, bread yeast or right. go to the brewer store and buy, you know, beer yeast and, mm -hmm. or champagne yeast. Yeah. That'll There's all work. There's all sorts of different that yeast. That will all but work. Yeah. It's and all yeast. And ferment it. And, you know, you're looking at it again, like, 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, and, again, it's got to be kept warm. Um, it, really, the temperature matters as far as, like, how fast and how well it's going to ferment. Um you know, like 60 degrees is your absolute bottom. Um, but, and that's going to ferment slower than if it's 75 degrees. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to go really over 80 degrees. Then you start getting into danger there where you're going to kill the yeast. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's one more option for you. Now, 
What? You got something? Nope. You, you, well, Kevin, Kevin I got looked a little, like he was going to drop some stuff. I got a you. little uh, little bit of uh, bootlegger history that I, I found that I thought was important. Uh, you have some bootlegger lore? Yeah, I, I thought that, you know, as I was doing the research, I kept found and finding uh, some pretty great stories. All right. Um, what do you got? Well, I just wanted to talk about uh, uh, first uh, Robert Glenn Jr. Johnson. Now, he's a famous NASCAR driver. Um, but he learned how to drive, and I think most of the listeners know that NASCAR comes from, um, you know, the the bootleg runners. That is rumored. Yes. That uh, would soup up their cars to outrun cops. Yes. But they didn't just uh, soup up their cars. It took a skilled driver, and when he started driving at 12, he was a natural. Natural. And not only was he excellent at driving, but he actually invented invented something that now we kind of take for granted. And it was called the uh, bootlegger U-turn. Now we, the bootlegger now U-turn. we call it a power slide, but that's not how, how it originated. No, it used to be a bootlegger U-turn. That's right. So, so you have a, a manual uh, transmission car, right? Cops are chasing you. Hot on your tail. Hot on the tail. Mm-hmm. Drop, drop it. Now, this works best with manual transmission and rear... Uh, rear powered tires, right? Um, rear wheel, rear wheel drive. Okay. So, drop it in a second. Go a little bit to the right, and then slam it to the left. It's gonna spin you out, twist you around, and now you're at a stop facing the opposite direction, and can can accelerate at full speed, and the cops are going the opposite direction and see you. Whiz by him going and they the other all way. Go, what? Right, like that. That's how you trick. You used to trick the cops. Now they are probably better at a power slide than you are. So wouldn't right. recommend it. But this was invented by boot. Now I was also told that back in the day, and I maybe have mentioned this before, but uh, people used to disconnect their brake lights, and that <laughs> yes. way you could slow down, and it makes it hard for those guys to judge uh-huh. what's going on. They don't know on. when it, when you're going to turn. Now, there's also uh, George Remus, who apparently was a very uh, accomplished bootlegger. I'd n- never even heard of his name. That's how good he was. He was a, he was a wealthy lawyer that would always, um, uh, he was making huge amounts of money defending uh, murderers. But he started realizing that all of a sudden, after Prohibition, all these criminals he was defending had a lot more money than he did. Now, he was not only a lawyer but also a pharmacist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what he did was he opened up a business where he manufactured legally alcohol for medicinal purposes. And it just happened that his employees were stealing all the shipments of alcohol before it got to where it was supposed to go. So he ended up making lots of money doing this. Uh, bought a huge ranch, uh, Death Valley Ranch, and um, was manufacturing it in the attic. And uh, with a dumb waiter, would bring it down, ship it out, distribute it. Uh, he got so rich that when he would throw parties, he would give away Pontiacs as party favors. Now that's boss. He that was is. giving away diamond, <clears throat> uh, diamond tie pins as party favors. He once... Uh, as a joke, pushed a, a kid into a pool and ruined his new suit, but he thought it was it was funny enough and worth doing, so he just paid him ten times what it would cost to get a new suit. Problem solved. Problem solved. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of class right there, you know. Now, he went to jail, eventually, and uh, his cellmate was a, um, was a federal agent trying to figure out where his money was, and he found out that his wife, all the the businesses, all the money was in his wife's name. <laughs> so the federal agent didn't report this. What he did was went and found the wife Some and convinced baby. her to elope with him. Yeah. So I mean, that's an obvious choice, right? So she she was filing for divorce from him. He got out of prison, had his driver on the way to. To the court to to file the divorce, had his driver chase him down, chase down his wife, ran the car off the road, 
and shot her to death. Smart. Because sometimes bros over hoes, you know, you don't let that that girl take the money. He went, so he went to court for obviously murder, got found not guilty for temporary insanity, and the uh, prosecutor said, well, now you have to go to an insane asylum because you're insane. But he said, wait a minute, you had three psychologists come in here that said that I wasn't insane. So you can't charge me with that. And he ended up going scot-free. Nice. That's classic. Mm-hmm. And he lived to about 85 years old. Now, I have some other uh, moving on. Now, one thing I would recommend is, I don't know if you guys remember, me and Kevin like to drink EDC coffee. We do. From uh, edccoffee.org, or I think it's edccoffeeco.org. Yeah, it currently still has an EDC sticker on it. It's been on there for about a year and a half All now. Right. So that may be something if you guys are making alcohol. Don't forget the morning after. That's right. Don't fall for that hair of the dog shit. It's a good idea, but it's not a good but idea. But it's not a good idea. <laughs> now, yeah, you can never get a hangover if you stay drunk. Another thing I wanted to point out, you guys remember last week we were talking about prison? Mm hmm. Now, one of the things I had in my notes was a lock and a sock. Mm-hmm. And I was going to talk about different prison weapons. Right. I don't think that came up. No, I think we never I might did have talk about that. It. Well, then I felt like I'm a bad guy because I'm looking at the paper today and Whitey Bulger yes. got killed in prison. By a lock and a sock. Was that, I was trying to figure out how he, he how they got He was probably him. listening to our, po- our podcast. Uh-huh. And he was like, oh, you know, I think I'm pretty good. And it's because I forgot. Mm-hmm. I had too many beers. I forgot to mention it. It was right. in my notes. And he wasn't watching and out And I could have warned him. I could have uh-huh. been like, hey, lock uh-huh. and a sock. Yep. Watch out for that one. I feel like I remember my first wife telling me about, <laughs> about beating a girl with a lock, a padlock and a sock. So... <laughs> You know, I mean, had he only seen, what is it? Um, if he had seen it coming. Well, what's the one with the sock, the soap and the sock? Oh, that's and, right. Uh, full metal jacket. Full metal jacket. Yep. Blanket party. Boot camp. Nobody, mm-hmm. you know, you got to watch out for that kind of shit. So, all right. I let you down a little bit on that one. Yeah, you got Whitey Bulger killed. <laughs> I mean, you know, come on. Um, But I do have a pro tip for and, you. Wait. wait a minute. If you're Whitey, you're 85 years old. Yeah. King Mobster. You didn't see that coming? Who the who is beating him to death? Let the man be. He's snitches, 85. Snitches get stitches. Uh, he always said he wasn't a snitch, but he did say that the FBI promised him immunity, so I don't know <laughs> exactly. how that works out. <laughs> That's the thing. He Come was on, supposedly... Buddy. Be honest here. He was an informant who never gave out any valuable information. According to him. According to him. But, you know, who knows? Um, Put that out there. Now, I was listening to Glenn Beck a couple weeks ago. And he had the pro tip that I I felt I had to bring to you guys. All right. Turns out, during the medieval times, they would use earwax as chapstick. And I was like, if that's not a prepper tip. Wow. That is... (laughs) You really got to be desperate, though. I'm just saying, when you're kissing the girl and she's got the soft lips in the apocalypse, mm-hmm. you know what you, you know, know what's what going she's on. Doing, uh huh. Just saying. Mm-hmm. I'm putting it out there. So we did send out some cool packages to our winners, right? From uh, you know, guys who were looking out for us on Patreon. I think I got everybody's patches out to them. I think we're all caught up there. Um, if not, I don't know what to tell you. Um, yeah, t- uh, Tim. Uh, Tim, we're working on got, your package. We've got your package Extra almost care. together. Extra love in there. Mm-hmm. Um, Made with love. We, we weren't really planning on a second one, and then last minute, you know, Kevin made a command decision, said he was going to make magic happen. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we, it took us a minute to get it together. Mm-hmm. But, with that, now, we would be interested in coming and partaking, if any of you guys make 
any uh, natural spirits. Yeah, I'm definitely uh, interested in hearing hearing uh, what you guys what your guys' opinions are. Uh, go on our Facebook page. Yeah, I would love to see a couple of uh, a couple of still setups. Um, if any of you guys got and them, stills are legal, just not operating stills. Right. right. And uh, and we're willing to come over to test. You know, we don't want you to get in trouble to uh, send it through the mail. So right, right. Now we live up north, but I'll travel to Appalachian. That's that's no problem. You're down. Uh huh. That's that's where the real good moonshine is made. So if you got some hooch you want to share, mm-hmm. Kevin's in. He's up for a good travel road trip. Yeah, let trip. me know. I'm All into right. it. Uh, if you guys want to email us at uh, preppingbadass at gmail dot com, um, love to get emails from you guys. We get a lot of great ideas from you guys. We um, do. You know, if you just want to send an email and say hi, that's fine too. Tell me what you're up to. What are you guys working on? Growing potatoes? Want to hear all about it? You want to turn those potatoes into vodka? You want to hear my mm-hmm. secret recipe? Now, last email week, Kevin. Last week, I had put some. Uh, Potato peels in the sink when I was peeling potatoes. Came back and there was vodka in the There sink? was no vodka. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> it doesn't sound right. But, you know, if you guys know how to do that, let me know. Tell me what I'm doing wrong with that. Um, yeah, and uh, as far as that, I think that's uh, that's all we got for tonight. All right. And stay safe, and we'll talk to you guys next week. The Survival and Basic Badass Podcast is a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Mm-hmm.